We've come now to session six. We're making good progress. I'm glad you joined me again. When we discussed the previous, in the previous sessions, we saw that we were able to go through the question of atheism, which says God does not exist, and we looked at theism, which says God does exist. We looked at both. Then we went on and looked at the theory of evolution. And there also we looked at two. Does the theory of evolution match the criteria for a scientific theory? Or does it not match the criteria for a scientific theory? So we did that together. And once we have finished that, we recognize that beyond the natural, it seems to be reasonable and scientific that there is the supernatural via the study of atheism and theism and also the study of evolution, whether it is scientific or not. When we do these kinds of studies, we recognize that it's a big topic. And remember what we had said earlier, when there's a big topic and we jump into it, one question leads to another and that leads to yet another and that's how it goes. And we also said that we would look at these questions squarely. We will not shy away from them. So now we recognize there might possibly have a good chance that beyond the natural, there is the supernatural. There could be God. So now the next question, if there is a God, is there an identity that we can have? Does he have a name? Can we identify that? So we're going to look at that. But just before we get into that, here's another concept we need to clear. It's a concept that says we as humans really cannot have a grasp of facts. We can make a guess, but we can never say it's a fact. It's called relativism. I wonder if you've heard of that. It says that all the statements which say that it's the truth of the matter are actually only relatively true. There is no such thing as real truth. For example, if I put my pointer on the right side of the table, we can ask ourselves, is it right or left? Now that depends on which side of the table you are on. If you're on my side of the table, then the pointer is on the right side. But if you're on the opposite side of the table, then that is on the left side. So which is this side of the table? Well, if I'm on this side, then this side is this side and that side is that side. But if I'm on that side of the table, then this side is that side and that side is this side. Can you see it goes back and forth and there's nothing set, nothing clearly set so that we can say this is the truth. So they pull that idea out. And the idea is correct, but when you pull it out, it comes out to what they call relativism. That means every statement on earth is only relatively true. There is no such thing as truth. Here's a statement by David Trueblood, who's describing this. There is no objective standard by which truth may be determined so that truth varies with individuals and circumstances. And Paul Fairabend, here's his statement. There is only one principle that can be defended under all circumstances and in all stages of human development. It is the principle, anything goes. I would like you to remember those words. Anything goes, which also means everything goes and which also means everything is acceptable. So what is relativism claiming? That all so-called truth is only relatively true. There is no such thing as absolute truth or truth. So we stated what relative truth is or relativism is. We have to also make a definition of truth or absolute truth. And here's one such de definition. Absolute truth is that which is valid for all people at all times, at all places. It does not vary with individuals and places. So now we have the question of whether relativism can be examined and will it stand scrutiny? So we're going to look at it in maybe two or three ways. Number one, the claim is that everything goes. That was Paul Fairbend. Everything goes. In other words, everything is acceptable. What's the meaning of everything? Is anything left out? No, everything means everything. Well then, 
it should also include absolute truth, shouldn't it? If it's everything, everything acceptable. So once you say everything is acceptable, you should be truthful. And if everything is acceptable, absolute truth also is acceptable. And if absolute truth is acceptable, well then relative truth is gone. Or relativism is gone. Relativism is that which states that all statements are only relatively true. How about another way of looking at it? Did you remember when I said right side of the table? It could also be left depending on which side of the table I'm standing on. So in other words, words themselves may not have fixed meaning. Right can be left depending on something else. So let's look at that sentence and make it into a sentence. Words have no fixed meaning. Think, that sentence with its words must have a fixed meaning to tell me what it is saying. So the very words, words have no fixed meaning, has to have fixed meaning. In other words, relativism really is a self-defeating prospect. It does not stand to real scrutiny. Here's another way of looking at it. Suppose... We say everything on earth or all statements are relatively true and only relatively true. Well, then they could also be relatively false. All statements, relatively false. Isn't that how, it's, how we could look at it? If it's only relatively true, well, relatively false as well. So here is, uh, are two people having a discussion. They want to know whether that statement is true. And one says it is true. And the other says no uh, that's not true. It could be false. Well, if that's the case, then let's appeal to the other factor, factor B, to find out if factor A is true or not. Because factor A is only relatively true and it could be relatively false. So we go to back factor B to find out if A should be taken as true or false. But B itself is only relatively true. So we go to C to find out whether B should be taken as false or true, and then on and on from A to B to C to D, and it will go on indefinitely. It is called infinite regression. We regress from the first question to the next and to the next and go on away from the original question. In fact, if relativism is the norm, which that's an oxymoron there itself, then you can't even ask a question because the question has different meanings of its words. And if an answer is given, well, the answer may be true or not, and that has to go to another factor to decide whether it's true or not. Can you see what's happening? We are in a sea of being mixed up in which we cannot even ask a question. So it looks, said Michael Jubian, it looks like any apparent suggestion of relativism is either self-defeating or else is not a real assertion, but something more like an empty slogan, not a philosophy. Ravi Zachariah says this, that is precisely what I believe postmodernism, which is relativism, best represents a mood. It is not a principle. It is not a philosophy. A mood, a mood can move back and forth. It is nothing stable there. So how can we state that everything on earth is just a mood? That would not be right. In other words, the words of Jean Veth kicks in right now. To say it's true that nothing is true is intrinsically meaningless nonsense. The very statement there is no absolute truth is an absolute truth. Think. Remember Paul Feyerabend's statement, there is only one principle that can be defended under all circumstances. Well, that's an absolute truth. To state that there's only one, nothing else, that's absolute. So what relativism is doing is sitting, plant, planting its base on an absolute truth and saying that it is not there. Well, really, if you sit on a strong branch, perch yourself there, and then ch chop the branch, what happens to you? You will fall. That is what happens to the truth of relativism, if there is that truth, when you examine it. Chop, fall. 
Relativism does not stand scrutiny. Relative truth does because there is relative truth. But relativism which says that every statement on earth is true uh, and only relatively true, that does not stand scrutiny. Now, there's a similar idea when it comes to religions. It's called pluralism. Look at the number of religions that could possibly be there. Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Sikhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shintoism. Well, this is only a partial list. And you know, when I first looked at that, I said, wow, how can we study all of that to figure out which one it is? But then I started asking people around and two clear-cut camps came into view. Camp number one. I asked, what do you think of this big long list? The answer was, oh, don't worry about that big long list. It could be big, it could be small, but there's only one of them that is correct, the one that I believe. It's called exclusivism. Mine is exclusively correct. Camp number one. Camp number two was, yeah, I know that big long list is there, but not to worry at all, because all of them are actually the same paths or different paths, the same goal. They're really the same. They have the similar features and similar doctrines and similar principles. They will get you to the same place. Not to worry, leave them there. But really, those are two very different camps. So I had to look and find out, and I'm asking you to come along with me. Let's look and find out which one really makes the better sense. I had to look at pluralism first because if that is true, well, I don't need to search. I sit where I am and I'm fine and you sit where you are and you're fine. So I looked at pluralism. What does it say? All religions lead to God. They are different paths but end up at the same destination. Here's a statement by W.E. Hawk. God is in the world, but Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad are in their little closets and we should thank them but never return to them. How about a Zen saying? Zen is the mystic form of Buddhism. Here it is. To understand God is to listen. Listen to Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha, but don't get caught up in the names. Listen beyond them. Listen to God's breath. And so pluralism recognizes not only the existence of other religions, but their intrinsic equal value. That is what Timothy George said. So, the claim is that they are not only valid and true, but equally so. They are intrinsically equal. Really? Is it true that the peaceful religions like Buddhism and Jainism are of equal value to the voodooism and those religions that require child sacrifice, murder? I wonder. So what I did was ask, where did they get this idea from, this idea of pluralism? They should have got it from the religions themselves. So I went there to ask what was written in these religious writings. And I looked at five great world religions, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, and Christianity. And when I read the writings, this is what I found. Here, the written codes in Hinduism, I, in this case, it is Krishna, the one whose picture is there. I am the goal, the upholder, the master, the witness, the home, the shelter, and the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis of everything, the resting place and eternal seed. And another statement from the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. Let there be one scripture for the whole world, Bhagavad Gita. Let there be one God for the whole world, Sri Krishna. And one hymn, one mantra, one prayer, the chanting of his name. How about Islam? In the Quran, chapter 2 and verse 255, ayah 255, it's supposed to be the regal or the coronation verse. Allah, there is no God but He, the living, the self-subsisting supporter of all. His are all things in the heaven and earth. His throne doth extend over the earth. He is the Most High, the Supreme. Then when we come to Buddhism, here's a statement. This Lord, meaning Gautama Buddha, is truly the Arhat. Arhat is a person who has reached the ultimate uh, level of attainment. 
fully enlightened, perfect in his knowledge and conduct, well gone, world knower, unsurpassed, leader of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, the Buddha, the Lord. Judaism, for thus said the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth, I am the Lord and there is no other. Did you notice that none of them want to give the other any quarters? How about Christianity? There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So I did not find a single religion that claimed that the others were an equal alternative. They all claimed to be themselves the only way. Not only did they do that claim, they also pointed the faults of the other religions. For example, the Buddha held that this belief in a permanent self or soul is one of the most deceitful delusions ever held by man. He is describing the Hindu doctrine of reincarnation. In Judaism, the words are, understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. One sentence and he has knocked off all the other competitors. How about Christianity? All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Knock them off. Islam, those to whom the burden of Torah was entrusted and yet refused to bear it are like a donkey laden with books. Wretched is the example of those who deny God's revelation. That is from the Quran. Who is it talking about? Jews and Christians. They say they are the only way and point to all the others and say they are not the way. So, if the words are donkey and wretched, thieves, robbers, deceitful and no God, each of them saying it, how can pluralism really claim that all the religions are actually true, equally true, equally good, equally valid? The fact is that the written codes clearly claim exclusivity. They claim to be the only way. Each religion claims that. Here's a statement by Ravi Zacharias. At the heart of every religion is an uncompromising commitment to a particular way of defining who God is or is not. Every religion at its core is exclusive. So pluralism does not appear to be an established idea when the writings are examined. However, every religion claims to be the only way. So now we have multiple claims claiming to be the only way. How shall we logically look at that? What happens when there are multiple claims to be the only way? Well, there is more than one way of looking at it. Number one, all are correct. That's absurd. If one says he is the only way, and the other says he also is the only way, both of them cannot be correct. Um, it could be all wrong. Yeah, that's not absurd. But how do you call anything wrong? Only when you have that which is right in your hands. And you and I are just inquirers. We do not have what is right in our hands to call them wrong. In other words, we cannot go up to any of the founders and say they are wrong. Otherwise, we'll have to go to Muhammad and say, Muhammad, I know what you said, but I think you're wrong. Or go up to Jesus and say, very good sermon on the mount, sir, but I think mm -hmm, that's not really good. It was not a good sermon at all. How can we say that? We have no authority, no knowledge, no position. So I could not call all of them wrong. If that's the case, I cannot call all of them right, absurd. I cannot call all of them wrong. I have no authority. I have no way of saying that any of them are wrong. Then there's only one option left. It's an amazing option. Only one is legitimate and correct in its claim to be the only way. In other words, a crucial, amazing, pivotal conclusion. There is one and only one religion that can make a legitimate claim of being the only way. In other words, there is one and only one way. Wow! Did you think of that? Think again. Think of how we came to it. We looked at all the writings. We saw the writing, what the writings say. And if we use logic, when every each religion claims to be the only way, then logically, you and have, I have to agree that out of all of them, there's only one that is correct and legitimate when it makes that claim of being the only way. Amazing. So now, if that's the case, what is the significance when it comes to the point of being the only way? Only one being the only way. 
Well, it was a conclusion reached by a neutral person. Destroys the con a concept of pluralism. And it also is a fundamental claim. In other words, it's such basic claim that if it is not the only way, well, it's a very suspect way then. And furthermore, it's a powerful motivating claim. You see these founders and these religions claimed that this world was not really good, that other world was better. And in fact, it's really bad here. So we need to get there. And they said, this is the only way to get there. Each of them said that. Powerful, motivating claim when you say it's the only way. It also will dictate the type of search we will now do. Because, tell me, if there's only one who is going to be champion, how far ahead should that champion be to be called a champion? How far is the Olympic gold medalist in a 100 meters sprint? How far ahead? 0 0.01 second and he is the gold medalist. He is the champion. He is the only one who can be called the fastest man in the world. None of the others. But all the others also ran so well. They ran almost like him. So he has to be up ahead. So the amount that a person is ahead is not the matter. Secondly, how else can we check this out? Just being ahead? That's not really the only way. There's another way in which we could check this out. And that is, can we compare apples and oranges? How far ahead of the other should it be? Very little bit. How else can we identify that only way? Here's a way. Think about this now. Suppose I'm looking for the correct colored marble. And in my hand, I have four purple, three blues, two greens, one red. Which is the correct color? If I say that only one is correctly colored, the red. Because there's only one of the red. So really to identify that only way, it does not have to be superior. There's no question of superiority or inferiority. There is only the question of whether it is different from the others. Now, the next question. So did you get that? Well, let's just test it out. Let's see, let's say that only one is doing it right. So suppose we are watching a race and everybody is running in the race except one competitor, he is walking. Which is the correct way to compete? Walking, because we had already said that there will be only one doing it right. How about another way? If everybody is going forward, only one is going backward, which is the correct way to go? <laughs> Backwards, because we had already stated that only one would be doing it right. So in other words, doesn't have to be superior or inferior or extremely impressive. It just has to be a very, very different, unique. Once it's by itself, that's the one. So that's the way to choose. But now we come to the tough one. How do you compare apples and oranges? Can you compare? No, you can't. But can you choose? There might be a way of choosing it, even though you cannot compare. Here's what I mean. Suppose I like oranges. And if you placed an apple and an orange on the table, I'd go for the orange. But this day, today, I'm hungry and I want to eat. And on the table is an apple and an orange. The apple is sweet and juicy, red and fresh. Whereas the orange is rotten and has worms in it. Now, which one would I choose? I would choose the apple. Although normally, in normal circumstances, I would have chosen the orange. Because I like oranges. So, did I choose between an apple and an orange? Yes and no. Yes, I chose between an apple and an orange. But if it was only an apple and an orange, I would have chosen the orange. So there has to be some other factor too. And with that factor, I say, no, I did not really choose between an apple and an orange. I chose between freshness and rottenness. Similarly, when we look at the doctrines and philosophies of these different religions, we cannot compare the doctrines and the philosophies. We have to look at another factor that we can put onto them. 
In, in my case, it was rottenness and freshness. When we put it onto the question, I made a choice that was so good that nobody would disagree. I chose the apple. Similarly here, we need to place something else onto the religious doctrines. And here's what it is. Every message that came to the human race as a religion came in the form of a story. History. Story. The tenets of the beliefs and the doctrines are based on the story. So what did I do? I turned my face from the doctrines to the stories and I started looking at the stories because the stories from where it was from where the doctrines came. So that is what would be the next quest. What about the stories of these religions? I was going to look at them and check that part. I called it the para-religious factors, not the religious factors. And I looked at those factors and I chose 10 questions and those 10 would form the way in which I would now put it onto the doctrines of the different religions and find out if I could now make a reasonable choice. Although I cannot compare apples and oranges, I cannot compare the actual doctrines and the philosophies and the tenets of beliefs. But I could do this and that is what we will now do in, from our next session onwards. We will look at the para-religious factors and then make a decision. Join me for the next session. If you have enjoyed this presentation with Dr. Subodh Pandit and wish to watch more of this unique 13-part series for free online, visit the website godfactorfiction.com. That's godfactorfiction.com. If you would like to order this fascinating series on DVD, it is now available from Whitehorse Media. To order from within the U.S., call 1-800-782-4253. Dr. Subodh Pandit has written two eye-opening books entitled, Come Search With Me, Does God Really Exist? and Come Search With Me, The Weight of Evidence, which further explore the topics of evolution, theism, atheism, and religion. To order these books from within the U.S., call 1-800-782-4253. If you live outside the U.S., you may also easily order them on Amazon.com.